talking about um, incarcerated artists and prison art, and specifically the work here of the class taught by Richard Guy, who's incarcerated at Fayette Prison near Pittsburgh. Today's discussion will center on the role that art plays in the life of a prisoner. <coughs> And I think with that, I'll turn the program over to Jody, Jody Guy, who's the executive director of the Wilkinsburg uh, Civic Center. And also, a spokesman for the incarcerated artist is Joe Ramirez, who's here in the doorway. And I can turn it over to Joe, too, if you want to come up yep. here. Yep, we're both going to. Okay. Nice. My work is done. Thank you. So, Richard Guy organized this from inside. From he's, inside. he's the lifer okay. inside. He's my first cousin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really, he puts his heart and soul into this. Yeah. As a, uh, Richard has an art room, and he has art instructors, and then they show the art in the visiting room. Is this common in, in state prisons, or is this a no. one -off? This is a very rare thing. They, Richard sold them on it. I am Richard's first cousin. Uh, we grew up in a little place called Wilkinsburg. It's just outside Pittsburgh. And it was a really rather normal upbringing, all in all, I'd say. But, you know, things happen. And he's working very hard right now. Um, these exhibits are his way of reaching out into the community so that he can prove to a commutation board, which is a board of, Joe can tell you um, more about the makeup of that board, but it's a state board who decides um, given time and, you know, whatever resume the person has. And really, they just want to see a person giving back to the community and uh, trying to make amends for, you know, the wrongdoings they had, you know, done as a young boy. He's a full-grown senior man at this point. Um, look, he's gone through so many health issues. Um, this Together we did this book. This is another outreach into the community. It's called Faces from Within. Inside are stories of really the atrocities that um, men inside uh, face, just really getting basic health care, whether it's a toothache or, you know, migraines or, you know, whatever the case might be, a broken leg. Richard has had cancer, hep C, and um, oh a myriad of other problems, kidney stones, and believe you me, they will let that man <laughs> just ride <clears throat> in pain before they'll spend the money to get an amb ambulance to them and take them. So they're really sent you know, serving two sentences. You know, they're, they're serving their, their legal sentence and then they're serving, they're giving their, their body and soul. So um, that said, you know, Richard, um, these by the way, um, you know, are available to you for a donation. Really, they're very telling stories. Um, any donation or um, sale, the proceeds benefit um, of course, um, Studio B, but they will also go back to SEI Fayette and support the art pro the art program that Richard instituted. I want Joe to um, give you his insider um, view of life inside the prison and what this art program would mean. Um, but also, I'd really like to hear your question. How did they make those little blocks on the, make those jewelry boxes? Okay. Is that all, all right. So, paper? all right. Talking about these right here? Yeah. So well, you take a piece of paper. I used to know guys, you make them out of, when they had a lot of smoke in jail, they used to make them out of cigarette packs, right? <laughs> you fold them into like a, you keep folding them, so you have like a strip this long, and all you do is just kind of like weave them in together. You fold them over, fold them over, fold them over, the one that goes through, you fold that over, and it follows it through. It's kind of like, it's almost like weaving, but with paper. Mm -hmm. And it looks like with this, the purple, what they did is they had purple paper that they took like an ink cartridge, like, like a, a tube, and just blew paint or ink on top of it to make that splatter. Oh. So it looks like they did. And the jewelry box? That's that same way. That's intricate. That's, I'll tell you what, that that's took that guy crazy. a long time to make that. <laughs> that's, a long, that's a lot of work right there. And now you need a little bit of glue and it holds and it's all good. Like there was, okay, when this juvenile lifer thing started, roughly about 500 juvenile lifers in Pennsylvania. So far, about half have left prison already. And most of us, probably 99% of us have been successful. So what I don't understand is how could yeah. lawmakers not look at that sample model and say, hmm, 
Those guys made it. They're doing well out there. Why not other, well, the other life sentence prisoners? They probably could walk out here and do the same thing that they did. Most people in prison are redeemable. Most people in prison should get that second chance. And we need lawmakers and, and, and politicians to understand that that's the norm. So I know it's against the norm to, to, to be, you know, go be soft on crime, as they call it. But how about just being smart on crime? That's they that's being smart. They say people that spent 40 years in prison, what purpose are you serving by just keeping them locked up in there and wasting our tax dollars when they could be productive members of society, working, paying taxes like something else? Uh, when I went to prison, there were six state prisons. Six. When I left prison, it was like around 30 of them. Oh, yeah, I know we have more incarceration than any other. Yes, we have a high incarceration rate, and you know it seems like they lock people up for the smallest things. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not defending. I'm not defending anything. I mean, right. You know, it's your responsibility. You commit a crime. Here's your consequences. Prison may be one of them. Might not be, but it may be one of them. Mm -hmm. My point is, when you have such a high incarceration rate and so many prisons in a state this size, you know it's not financially feasible to continue to keep yes. prison people in jail the rest of. Them. That's just how it is. And the thing with the life sentences, it's just about pure punishment. If I'm a politician and I'm my, my base is on tough on crime, well, hey, listen, you got life, you're gonna stay in prison the rest of your life, and I'm gonna stay that way. Because people like kind of like that for some reason. I don't know why. It takes citizens to, to speak up, it takes citizens to get involved with politicians and say, look, you gotta be a better way. Do the victims' families go to these hearings? I'm glad you asked that. I am so glad you asked that nice. because sometimes, yes. So when I went to get resentenced, I'm from Lehigh County, by the way, that's where my case happened. So I went down there and the lady who, you know, whose life was taken, her great nephew was there. I had a chance to apologize to him face to face. That felt so good to be able to tell him, listen, I'm so sorry for that. I'm so sorry I took away those memories from you, things like that. And at the end, he came in bitter, but at the end, he realized, he says, listen, man, he says, I'm all for this guy getting resentenced, you know? So it's just, how do you explain your way? How do you come off? As a kid, I wasn't that way. As a, I, I couldn't show him more. So you know what the hell the word meant. But as an adult, I understood it more. And so I was able to express my sorrow and the grief that I caused him to help him understand that people change. You grow up and you change. You were allowed to go to the first hearing, but not to the second one. What do you mean? Well, didn't you say... Yeah, that's that's commutation system. That's oh, different. Oh, okay. I got resentenced. I went to the county and a judge oh, okay. took my life sentence away and resentenced me to a different term. Okay. So at that point, I was I had to be present to be resentenced. And again, you know, victims, one of the victims' family members showed up, and, and like I said, I, I I wasn't worried about it. I wanted to express how I felt to him. So the, the victim, like in Richard's case, he can't even speak for himself. Well, you talking about Richard himself or yeah, Richard? No, if he has, if he gets a public hearing, he can't attend that. Now the oh, board will, the board will meet with him. The the, the five oh. member board will meet with him okay. just for a short meeting. But on the day of his public hearing, you need a representative to go and speak in behalf for you. Huh? So he, that person, that person will speak in behalf for him. The DA may send someone there. They may not. And you know, and then the board will have to decide to whether to vote. Yay or nay. They all vote yay. It goes to the governor's desk. He has a year to sign. But first, you have to, he has to get through the... Commun he, has to get the he has to get to the merit review. He has to get what's called a mater 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 yeah, meritorious uh, application. Okay. So did this fail the first time at the second? Did he receive a public hearing before? No, no, they, no, they never even gave him a chance. So he didn't, they didn't find his first application meritorious. So, what year was that? It was, I don't want to say it was maybe five years ago now. Oh, wow. You have to wait so long, and then COVID shut everything down, yes. and the panel wasn't meeting. Mm -hmm. But do they give a reason? They don't no. have to give a reason. No, they don't, they just don't give a reason. I live each day to be as successful as I can. I live each day to say, you know what? I appreciate this freedom I've been given, this opportunity I'll never ever get again if I ever go back. So this is why I hope that every person leaving prison could feel and think the same way.
And today is just a small sample with the artwork and what the talent that lies within that people have these abilities and these, and these talents within themselves to change themselves, to come out and become better people. And I thank you all for supporting this thing and just showing up and listening to me and listening to Jody. And right, in Pennsylvania, first degree murder and second degree murder, like I got, carries a mandatory life sentence. Now, when I first got arrested and first got convicted, this is back in the late 70s, even my judge and DA says, oh, don't worry about it. You'll, get com you'll be commuted in 15 years. You'll be out. So they all felt that way because at that point in time, commutations were flourishing. You had governors like Schaefer and Schaap that let hundreds and hundreds of lifers out. But something happened along the way. The war on drugs hit in the early 80s. And people got tougher on crime. People got fed up with it. You got more stringent governors in it. So here's how the commutation system works now for a life. Like, you know, you do good, you, you live your life in prison, you try to do as much as you can. You follow what's called commutation. They review your paperwork. If two out of three considered you have merit, you're granted a public hearing. So that date, your public hearing, now as a life sentence prisoner, you don't get to go. A representative goes there and speaks on your behalf. They get about 15 minutes to talk. The DA's office usually sends someone, they get 15 minutes to tell you why you shouldn't get it. You present these to the full board, five members on the board. For a life sentence prisoner now, you need a 5-0 vote to get to the governor's office. Oh, you get that vote, no, it goes up in front of the governor. And he, if he agrees, he'll sign it, and your life sentence becomes life on parole. And you get paroled and go out to a halfway house for a year, then to your home. But it's such an uphill climb. The first thing about it, we have five, I can pick any five people out of here, we have a discussion on something. Maybe five of us won't look, it, say the same thing. We might not agree on it the same way. One person might say, no, I think it's this way. So for a life sentence prison to get even past the board is so difficult these days. That's and why we're going to do these things that go above and beyond. Right. You know, not just inside the prison. If you can see, started the art program. He's helped the library. He works with Drexel and um, Penn State University to get their um, people in to work with the prisoners on a variety of different... He teaches life skills. He's the orientation guy in the prison. So when anyone comes in, he's the one that shows them the ropes, tells them what's up, what not to do, what to do like one-on-one, -on -one, right? So the prison actually respects him and trusts him enough to do this independent of them. And all these things he's doing, and now's the time. He's gonna submit, after this exhibit, he's gonna submit his next, his, last, his final packet. He, you can only do it twice. So this will be his final, his final chance to get commutation. But I definitely appreciate the fact that I was able to speak to you guys today and give you some insight on what it's like and. What I've been through and what probably everyone who drew some of this wall goes through. And it just, it, it's incredible. And like I said, I, I, again, I feel so blessed being out here. And, you know, I don't want to give up for anything. And it, this freedom is just so nice. And I wish everyone leaving prison, whether they did a year, 50 years, and in between, could feel like I do and just put the effort forth to, to live out here and just want to stay out here. And I thank you. Thank you. You're not trying to fight the laws. You're not trying to fight a sentence. You're just trying to say, look, this person is redeemable and this is why. Here's, here's his, you know, he's sorry because of this. This is why, he's remorseful. Here's his remorse picture. And that's what their job is to do when he gets to that point. Yeah, you, know, you make, you know what? You kind of make your own luck out here. You, 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 but that's true in life, yeah. period. I'm a hard worker. I go hard. Yeah. At they love me because I work so hard. Yeah. I work them people under the table and they know it. And it's like I said, they like having me there. But exactly. that's the way you got to be. Because if you're not, then, well, you know, hey, next. Who's next? Who wants to try this next? And I just want to stay out here and keep busy and be successful and get as far as I can in life. You know, I'm 59. You know, I can't even think about retirement. I don't have enough save for that. I mean, you know, I haven't been working my whole life. So it's like I got to look at yeah, those things. Yeah, you don't get Social Security in jail, do you? No, you don't. No. I mean, even when I do collect, I don't know how much I'll get because yeah. I haven't paid. I haven't paid my whole life into it. Okay, I think um, maybe we're at time. Yes. Yeah. Well, Joe and Jody, thanks so much. That was thanks really so interesting. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome.
welcome to Studio B for yet another Friday Night Live. And Sue and I are here and featured in the Grey Gallery this time is Prison Park. And it's very inspiring. Sue, take it away. So we're really excited to have this show here. It is all really curated by a prisoner named Richard Guy, who's been in since 1983 in the uh, Pittsburgh prison. And he's an artist, and he found ways to help other inmates make art as therapy. And uh, so he has come full circle, got an education, it's been many years, and he has a lot of people following him. And it was really cool to reach out through our local library uh, to have his show here. And if you come in, there's a lot to learn. It's very interesting. There's layers of all kinds of prison life, and there's a little bit of thought about prison reform in it, but it's not pushy. And if you get in here and see it, um, we are selling off the wall like crazy um, the pencil drawings, and pencils are pretty much all they have in prison. So if we have something with color in it, it's they found something and we're able to make color. So there are no art supplies there, and uh, so this stuff's pretty impressive given that. Um, and even we even have some from women's prison here. We have knitted hats and things, but we're excited to share this new um, for us uh, avenue of art and how art can change people's lives and, and it's, it's inspiring to see. Yeah, I just want to introduce you to one of our state senators, Amanda Cavaletti. And um, Amanda and I go back away as Amanda was one of my students and one of my top Bear Fever people, Justice Starr, who just did so many things for Bear Fever, but one of her projects now, I believe, is Prison Reform. You want to talk about that a little bit, Amanda? Thank you so much, Jean, and thank you, Sue, for bringing attention to um, this really important issue and criminal justice reform. In Pennsylvania, we have a lot of people who are sentenced to life without parole, which is essentially death by incarceration. And what you're finding here is that many of these prisoners are trying to find ways to turn their lives around, to do something better, and they're expressing that through their art, and it's a beautiful thing. We know the pandemic has really impacted all of us, but especially those who are in our prison systems and incarcerated because they really lost touch with all of the resources and programming that used to come in and be able to provide them with something to look forward to to help them change their lives. So I encourage you to come down here, learn a little bit more about what it is like to be incarcerated, uh, learn a little bit about what they're doing and the artwork that they're putting together and how they're expressing their feelings and dealing with their, uh, their griefs and their trauma through this work. It's a beautiful thing and I'm so happy and so proud as a Warrior Town grad to see this come to our community to bring light to this issue. So thank you guys so much. And so Amy, I believe you're going to take a little visit around the uh, the exhibit today. So thank you so much everybody for being here. We thank our sponsors. Uh, we thank all the folks who have donated to Studio B and are continuing to donate to Studio B for these um, Friday Night Live events. We thank Pumpkins this thing. You have to follow me through here into our abstract show, which has been up for a few months, also selling off the wall. We have Mr. Yacht Van Leer. Hi, is here tonight, and he is one of the people who brought this to my attention. And did Carolyn leave? I don't know where Carolyn is. But there's Carolyn. Carolyn. Ryder, who is um, a local library worker, is the person who connected with Richard Guy and brought up this to us. And we had a talk last weekend, and it was a really interesting thing to learn that Pennsylvania is one of the only states that has real actual life sentence where it never ends. All the other states even touching us are 20 years. And so the resources that it costs to keep somebody in prison for 20 years plus um, are really a burden on all of us. So. Um, when people turn their lives around and they prove it, um, it's pretty interesting to see what they can do in here. This is just art, but as we believe, art is actually essential. So um, I'm going to let Amy have this, and she's going to take you back into, we've created a prison cell back here if you want to come check it out. And uh, so go lock yourself in, Amy. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Um, this is the Gray Gallery, which is the back room of Studio B, uh, where we have uh, different featured pieces. 
So um, we're just going to start walking around. I'll talk about a few pieces. If you see something that you are interested in, I can tell you more about it um, just based on the descriptions that are here. Um, so we've got um, Richard Guy did uh, piece number four down here. Um, again, as Sue said, when they use color, they have to get very creative with their medium because they, they don't really have resources um, to use. I'm just gonna walk over um, this very large piece um, is also from Richard Guy, who is currently incarcerated. Uh, it says, I drew this poster in 2016 for a therapeutic community project. I taught a weekend class and helped out with the art committee. It was posted for several years as evidenced by the patina. This advocated the no smoking policy in the drug rehab section. So this is a fairly large piece. Um, and if you look at the detail, there's a lot of really uh, intricate shading here. And it's, uh, it's a unicorn with a cigarette. Um, <laughs> going up in flames there, so very interesting piece. Okay. And as we go through, um, there are some other pieces. Um, these are just little, little kid pieces, he calls them. Example of envelope art by Richard Guy. Um, there's some more pieces down there from him. I'll give you the information I have. If you have questions or you want to zoom in on something, just let me know. This is a very um, different kind of display here at Studio B because obviously we don't have guest artists tonight. This is uh, these are all incarcerated individuals and using art as part of their rehabilitation process. Okay, this is from a graffiti artist from New York City. It says, I grew up in the early 1970s spray painting on the subway cars in the Bronx and later switched over to murals on smooth walls. Um, just says that his name is Showtime. It doesn't even give his name, actually. So there's a welcome message from Richard Guy from the inmate artists at the State Correctional Institute at Fayette. Enjoy the exhibit. All right, we're going to keep moving here. Um, says this and the next piece are from a fella who has never drawn before until my class. So here are, um, here are the pieces. Yeah, and it says Jim Brown is the artist. Again, we don't really have information about the individual artists. Uh, this just says Pander, and then it has his his number. Um, inmates are all assigned numbers. So sometimes we don't even really have a full name; we just have their number. Again, most of these are going to be lacking in color because all they really have to work with is pencil. So, given that information, it's more remarkable, I think, to see some of these um, these pieces and the detail involved in them and, and just a lot of these guys haven't had training they've just been inspired and it's been part of their rehabilitation process to get in touch with their artist so, this says family first and I don't know who the artist is there I'm not sure. <laughs> this says, Night Owl, only nature knows the beauty inside the Lord's creation. And it says, S. Rader is the artist. I'm not sure the name on this one. Everyone just has um, his signature and his number there. And you can see that Sue has uh, enclosed this entire room in barbed wire. 
It's kind of cool. <laughs> Sue is always doing fun things like that. There's no signature that I can see on that one. I don't can't really make out exactly who that is, but again, most of them, if they don't have a legible signature, most of them have a serial number, but not all. <laughs> And we're just imagining we're all smoking their cars being What can go wrong there? I can go wrong and say hissing stuff's coming out. Says Philly Street Gang member, Australia, Flash Australia. Artist. And the reason they're doing this is because you're charcoal copies. It says student charcoals. Complete coal more charcoal. Some of these are a little dark, just kind of reflecting the different emotions that I'm sure cycle through when you're incarcerated. One of two brothers here, very talented, did this with a simple number two pencil from Beaver Falls, is what it says. Again, there's no name associated with it, just a description. You know, mm -hmm. thought that they had enough this is another piece really from Richard Guy. It's, not it's so called Laughter. Next thing you know, there's like people getting stuck in elevators because power suddenly goes out. And I mean, don't they have gas or they don't have to buy gas from Russia? Because well, gas is what fills in every time there's they put a cowboy there. And usually, rate of solar and stuff, I heard it's just for gas. And that's Richard somebody. Yeah. Hilbert, maybe? Yeah, that's the last name there? Yeah, no. No. Okay. And then the so one below that is very colorful, got, but it does not have. They've got one region that produces a lot of coal. I don't think they have a lot of gas. Oh, here we go. James Heckman. Okay, so there is a description for that. It says, James Heckman. My name is James Heckman. I am serving a lengthy bid here at SCI Fayette. I have always had a natural talent for drawing and I've been doing so most of my life. I have taken some professional drawing classes and I've taken the drawing course offered here several times. Drawing is an outlet for me that allows me to express myself and it is also a great way to pass time. I often lose myself in drawings. This drawing is representative of what I feel when I think of my incarceration. I often feel small and insignificant as if forgotten and left behind. Time feels like it is broken, but also passing me by. The past is always in my mind and it weighs heavy on my heart. There is a constant reminder of the things left behind. Some things are hard to put into words. Conversely, some thoughts are hard to depict. I try to evoke a sense of regret along with sadness in this piece because that is often the way I feel. Time is broken and fleeting. You feel manipulated and broken as time passes you by. All this while attending what feels like a circus sideshow. And then he also did this piece next to it. It shows uh, a scared child inside a man's body. Yeah. Answer is no. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple more pieces of his. It says the cowboy is his. And the colored pencil is a picture of Bobby, his girlfriend. Right. And then True. another one at the top is his. This is called Medieval yeah. Soldier. To Philly and to Delaware. That's where it was. That's going to be any better than bringing inside really. Mm -hmm. Detail is really incredible to see in person. Okay, here we have another artist, Jim Brown. He won the Black History Month art contest in 2020. And that's picture number one, which would be this one. Jim Brown. But yeah, the lag is going to. Okay. Oprah is another piece by Jim Brown. It won Black History Month Art Contest in 2021. And number three, Crazy Albert, it's called. And that's also by artist Jim Brown. I'm not sure who did this piece here. 
no pipeline through the beautiful James. Right around. Could be <laughs> could be Jim Brown <laughs> also. It doesn't list that's him that's on the so description though. So I have mixed feelings on that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the XL sure. is the so we have a couple sculptures here, and I'm not clear on who produced these sculptures. So we'll have to circle back to Jane and Sue and find out more info about what these are all about. So here we have a charcoal by Robert Brown Lee. And this was done in a class using a follow along technique for students. So they offer these classes at Fayette, which is where Richard Guy is incarcerated. And this is again Robert Brown Lee does this, uh, did this pencil drawing. All right, so we have a description up here. Um, Lagoon Cats by Robert Brown Lee. While avoiding the appearance or supposition of afterthought, consideration of whether an added element will or will not be a focal point, or does it become a focal point once it's seen? So there's the Lagoon Cats. And I'm assuming he's referring to the catamaran that's down here is another Robert Brownlee. And this is another follow along for students. This is done in pencil, not charcoal. From a beginner's class. And this is all pencil. And here is uh, another follow along with Robert Brownlee. For the beginner class. Okay, moving down. Okay, so we have. Now, this is something a little bit different here. This is a Trumpet Player by Van Maestrate. It says, I played the trumpet and studied music at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. These are the other instruments I can play. So I'm not sure how this ties in here, but again, I'll have to follow up with Jane and Sue um, to get more info on that. And then here's a couple of other uh, items. So moving further along, we have self-portrait in number two pencil. Graduate of Pittsburgh Art Institute, professional artist, Indiana resident. Okay. Um, and there's not a lot of information beyond that to show, uh, but it looks like this person enjoys sketching famous people. So we've got some faces we can recognize. Clint Eastwood down there. Thanks for stopping by, Ryan. Yeah. All right, um, we have um, some books here that you can look through about prison art. It tells you a little bit more of um, individual stories and shows you some more art, gives you a little more information. Um, you can see quite a few of these are sold already, indicated by the red dots on them, but all of this art is for sale. And the detail uh, <laughs> using what limited resources they have here. Um, it's pretty incredible to see what they can do with just a pencil. The detail and the imagination that they have. All right, here's a legible one. It says Aaron Brown. <laughs> They're not all legible, but again, most of them have their serial numbers there if you can't uh, see the name you can see that they have their um, their incarceration number okay. 
Some of these are, uh, you know, a little dark, and some of these are surprisingly cheerful. I guess you run the gamut of emotions as you go through your process. Damien Lipinski is the artist for this one. Um, okay, here's some more information. I think I went backwards on that one, so I apologize. Um, so, number 12, Theodore Orr. This is Aretha Franklin, okay? And this was an exercise in class to capture someone's essence, and it's a good facial. Um, the snakes and skull. This was um, a tattoo, and it was tattooed on his cellmate's chest. <laughs> Tommy Sabbath. And did the microphone and this was uh, this was an exercise to draw a logo and this gentleman was a musician so this was his logo that he designed again it, while he was incarcerated okay here's another Aaron Brown down here um, a tribute to his brother number nine is another Richard Guy and it says, I drew this to show students how to draw on toothless paper. So, there's that picture from, again, it's all um, pencil with fine shading. All right, so there's a couple more there. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> All right, and number one, I think we missed. There's a train up there. Um, and this person is no longer incarcerated, and he's now a tattoo artist in Pittsburgh. So this is someone who did this while he was incarcerated, but he is now uh, formed, and he's out, and he's made a career for himself as a tattoo artist. And it doesn't actually say who Simo. Okay, Cosimo Liberto. Number 13 says, very fast drawer. Did this in approximately 12 minutes. So this dachshund, and the artist's name is Mosley. That's all we have. Did this drawing of a dachshund in 12 minutes. This person's name is Brandon Grover. He did this watermill. Uh, a fantastic details artist, and he is now one of the teacher's aides for these art classes for the um, incarcerated individuals who take these art classes as part of their um, reform. So there's one of his. There's another one of his somewhere in here. Let me just see if I can find it. Um, yeah. If I find it, I will focus in. On, oh, here it is. It's the bear. Okay. <laughs> Again, this is the, the detailed artist. Brandon Grover, and he's now an assistant instructor for the art program at the prison. Okay. As Sue mentioned earlier, there's some handmade knitted caps and things uh, from the women's prison. And let's say it says, My name is Diane M. I am currently incarcerated at the Women's State Prison in Cambridge Springs near Erie. I greatly enjoy knitting by hand. I also teach it to the younger girls. I specialize in garments like the ones on exhibit. If interested in any, please contact, it says, uh, Carolyn Ryder. I make good Christmas gifts. Help me to eke out an existence here as well. So that's uh, Diane M. from the Women's State Prison in Cambridge Springs. She does all this knitting. And the pieces that are here are available. It says they are $10 each. So if anybody's interested, come on down to Studio B. So that covers the exhibit. I'm just going to interrupt for a second. <laughs> um, I didn't know if there's anything else you wanted to say. There were a couple of 
really colorful pieces in there and I wasn't exactly sure um, if that was just a little bit something different. I mean I think they do get like crayons and colored pencils but they're maybe not archival art supplies. It's a privilege right? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Um, it's not like people or family can send any to um, no, it has to go through a public library, so we're hopeful that we're a civic organization or something like that, but um, we're collecting all the money that we're, we're not taking any cut and we're um, sending it to the civic organization in Pittsburgh that um, will be able to bring the art supplies to these people in the prison that he's currently in. And this is one of the things he's doing to show that he's you know, maybe possibly to be commute, you know, like, get out. Mm -hmm. um, he's been in for a very long time, has done everything to improve his life, and help a lot of other people learn that they can have value for, with the art. Um, since we're looking at all these things in here, and, you know, a lot of them are drawings from classes, but there are people literally sitting and drawing cards every day to try and sell them to other inmates so that they can have money for commissary. So it's, it's pretty amazing and a lot of people finding resources in color from, I don't know where they get it, like, you know, maybe they're working in the electric department or something mm -hmm. and they find something and they, yeah. So it's interesting to see how it's going, but I'm excited if people would come down, we'll be here um, Saturday, Sundays um, from 12 to 2 and if you want to see it in person, come on down.